thank you for being here. I would like to start off on behalf of myself and Rachel. I'm a little bit late getting started this morning with all the mic took so long off. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to try to explain the lesson this morning. I've titled it something that I think that from the part of the world that we live in, we can all re relate to. You need to get in a boat. Get in a boat. This morning, 2 Peter 2, 4 through 5. It was read, and I'll read it again. For God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them in the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. God hates sin. And did not spare the entire ancient world, but saved only Noah and eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. If there's anything apparent in the story of Noah and the ark, we need to learn it. After all, he was the grandson of Methuselah, the oldest man that ever lived on earth. But right after this begins the age-old problem. And I think everybody in here that is uh, a human being can relate to this. Genesis 6-2, the sons of God, that's us boys, saw the daughters of men, and that's you girls, and they were beautiful, and you are. That became a problem. A big problem. And it still is today. Genesis 6, 12. God looked upon the corruption of the flesh of the earth. Just made him sick. And obviously, since then, it's just kept getting worse and worse and worse. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 speaks of a little leaven. Leavens the whole loaf. In other words, a little sin in someone's life, in your family or in your life, can spread and leaven the whole loaf. It can spread sin far and wide and it seems to never stop. Sin is a problem. Sin was a problem back then and it's a problem now. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. Look at Noah's faith. Being divinely warned, just like we are, every day of our life, if we ever look, study, or even think about this book, God is warning us today. This, this morning in the lesson, not my lesson, but God's lesson, He's warning all of us, just like He did back then. And He's using the story of Noah to warn us as well. Being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Noah knew there was sin in the world. Noah was warned. And he was moved with godly fear. If we can only be moved today with godly fear, even these that are amongst us today, if we can actually quit looking at other faults and look in here and see the fault of our own and be motivated and moved with godly fear to do something about it. It says He prepared an ark for the saving of His household. We need to prepare a spiritual ark for the saving of those around us our children, our grandchildren, our great God, all those that we love, we need to help them as Noah did to be saved from sin, from the destruction that it causes. <laughs> By which you condemned the world and became heir. And that's what we all want to do. Co-heirs with Christ and spend eternity in heaven. Not alone, but with those that love us. You know, the men of today, and I am speaking of the men, but not only the men only, but now the women too. We need to all search our souls and realize those that you love, 
They're depending on your example, on your influence, on helping them to understand the true gospel of Jesus Christ and get to heaven. And we need to see it in our lives. I need to see it in your life, Daddy. I need to see it in your life, Brother. Your life, Mama. Your life, Sister. Show me how to act and be come a child of God. And if you're not doing that, get in the boat. Get in the boat. Knowing sin is in our world today in somewhat overwhelming manner, and it is. Do we have a chance? Do our children even have a chance in such a sinful world? We're no more sinful than they were at the time of Noah. The earth was full of sin. And God hates sin. He proved it, didn't He? Seeking, uh, speaking of Noah's faith, let's compare his faith to our faith today. Genesis chapter 2, 4 through 6 says, God had, uh, had not caused it to rain on the earth, but a mist went up out of the earth and, and, and watered the whole face of the earth. Now, in the next verse, he actually did the creating. He breathed man. He talks about it. He, he breathed life into the man. But that had already happened. So, at the time of Noah, had it rained? I've read commentaries. I can't even spell commentary anymore. Some people believe that it still rained. Some people say absolutely it did not rain before the flood. Well, I would personally lean towards it didn't rain before the flood, but then again, what difference does it make, really? It does not change the fact of Noah's faith. Here you are, a man in the world, Noah, all by yourself, God talking to you, and all these people out here are not listening to God. And God tells you, and I want you to build a, a box-like boat. I want it to be three stories high, 450 foot long, uh, 75 foot high, 45 foot wide. How's that for faith and devotion? That would take a lot of faith, wouldn't it? Well, I mean, yeah, I guess. What do you mean you guess? Today, God makes it clear, and I will at the end of this sermon, how to become a child of God. I will spell out the plan of salvation. What does that mean, preacher? It's God's plan, and there's many verses I could instill into the same thing that all lead us to the same, same ending. We have to be able to get on the boat. And I'm going to talk about getting on the boat during this sermon. How is that for faith and devotion? It is great. And compare that to our faith and devotion today, it seems like too much trouble to have to get up and walk up here and be, I don't think I need to be bound off. I know what the book says, but I'm not sure it's right anyway. Mm. Our faith is being tested daily. How is our faith and devotion compared to Noah? Can we find scripture that will show the similarity of the flood to our lives today? Is it in the book? 2 Peter 3, 6 through 9. Listen closely. By which the world that then existed perished. Why did it perish, preacher? Because it was full of sin. And it, he flooded the entire world with water. Even the, the tallest mountain peaks. God hates sin. He's trying to get our attention through this story that we can apply today to our lives. We need to listen to the Scripture, not what a man thinks. Let me tell you the way I, I feel. But I don't care how you feel. Show me the Bible. Show me what God says. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same Word. What's that? The Word of God. Here's the book. Are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly. Yesterday I saw a gorgeous, beautiful rainbow. You may have seen the same thing. Wasn't it gorgeous? I will never flood the earth and destroy it again with water. 
but he certainly will with fire. 2 Peter 3, 6 through 9, but which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved in the same word, and reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Sinners, beware. Sinners, be warned. Weak, be warned. Those that put off obeying the gospel, be warned. Those that are unwilling to change your life and repent of your sins, be warned. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. That with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness. I thank God to forget it. I, I, I sinned and I was weak and I did wrong, but I thank God to forget it. it it's been a while now. I, I swept that under the rug. I, enough time will cure anything. You need to listen to this. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness. One day is a thousand years. We know what happened a thousand years. It's just like today with God. He remembers it. He remembers our sins. We have to be able to get rid of them. But His long suffering, He's patient with us toward us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why is God putting up with sin today? God created every person on earth. God breathed life into their bodies. God and gave them a life to live. And God, through His wonderful creation, wants every person on God's green earth to repent and follow His Word. That's what He wants us to do. He warns us. Well, I don't like to be warned. I don't like the baby telling me what to do. Well, you'll have to take that up with God on Judgment Day, my friend. Get into the boat and get into it now because it can be too late. Noah knew to get in a boat. God didn't tell him to get in the boat. He said, well, I, I'm not going to do right now. I don't feel like it. I, I'll get around to it, God. I, I don't feel really religious right now. I, I got too many things I need to sort of take care of my life. When I get ready, I'll let you know. When, when I decide to really get committed to your word, I'll, I'll let you know, God. Hey, would you, would you come on and, and worship God with me? Not today. I don't feel like it right now, but I probably will tomorrow the next day. When are you going to go with the Word of God? I feel like you're pressuring me, boy. I'll do it when I get good and ready. God said, no, get in a the boat. There wasn't no waiting, no doubting. There wasn't no questioning. Well, let me find something wrong with what you said. God, He got in the boat. Genesis 7, one, verse 1 and verse 5. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come in to the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Verse 5. And Noah did according to all the Lord commanded him to do. When? Right now. How do you even know they'll be tomorrow? How do you know when you get ready will be even here? We don't know. All these people on earth thought maybe, well, I mean, I see them building a big old boat. Maybe it'll happen one day, but I ain't worried about it. It's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen right now. Just like we do today. Yeah, I'm going to get religious, but I'm going to straighten up. Right now, I'm, I'm young, and, and i got wild oats to sow. Well, right now I'm old and I never really got to do all the things I want to do in life. I'm going to do them now. You come up with a bill you get excuses not to get in the boat. In 1 Peter 3, 20 21, Peter speaks about God's long suffering, waiting while the ark was being prepared. How can I apply that to us today? God is still long suffering. Those of us that have never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we may, have, we may have obeyed what man has taught us, what he thinks, what he feels, but we have not done what God says. You're waiting. There's people that have been 
baptized into the body of Christ today that need to repent and change something in their life, but they're saying, I will want to get ready. But I would never say it that way. You might not use those words. That's what people say. I'm not ready yet. Jesus compared the days of Noah to today, Matthew 24, 35 through 39. It speaks of a lot of things in there. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not. My word will not. Only God knows when heaven and earth will actually pass away. Well, I think it'll happen in a thousand years. I think it'll happen in ten thousand years. It can happen before I say the next word. Are we ready? Are we ready? God destroyed the whole world, and yet man still sits here today thinking he's above and beyond anything God might do to him. Oh, man. The flood came. Just as the coming of the Son of God Himself, Jesus Christ, will come. Like in the days of Noah, people were sinning. They were living their lives. They were barbecuing out. They were having a good time. They were watching TV, football back on. All these things are important to us. But they were not listening to the messenger. They were not listening to Noah. They certainly didn't have any reason to listen to God, they thought. I'm doing you a favor, God, to come here and worship you. Woo. Matthew 24 speaks of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. It also speaks in Matthew 24 relating back to Noah and the flood. The people didn't really think Jerusalem would ever be completely destroyed. There wouldn't be knocking one stone on top of another. It wouldn't really be that much devastated. In the, in the flood, God's not going to kill everybody. Give me a break. I mean, he, he, there's, there's people worse than me. He'll get them, but he ain't not going to give them. I'm not all that bad. As they perished. The second coming of Christ. By the way, take your Bible and you find this is your homework. Find the third coming. It's not there. There's just a second coming of Christ. There's not a third, fourth, fifth, nowhere. When He comes back again, there's just one thing. The second coming. The second coming of the Lord. Obviously, most do not believe, as do most. Most people in the world don't believe that Jesus Christ, first of all, they don't even believe in Jesus Christ. They don't even believe in God. But if he did, he's not going to come back. Well, that doesn't change the fact that we need to get in the boat now. You keep talking, preacher, about getting in the boat. What do you mean? 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. This is our great warning. God's warning all of us, so let's listen up. But the day of the Lord will come, church. And it will come as a thief in the night. In other words, we won't pre be prepared. We may be sleeping. We won't have our mind on it, just like in the days of Noah. And then, boom, here it is. And once it booms, it's too late to do anything. There will be no more repenting. There will be no more obeying. You won't have to worry about reading your Bible. You won't have to worry about praying. You won't have to worry about putting up with people trying to get you to do right. You don't have to worry about all that no more. It'll all be over. In which the heavens will pass away. There will not be a kingdom built on earth again. It won't. John 18, 36 says, My kingdom is not of this world. It is a spiritual kingdom. In the end, Jesus Christ will deliver His kingdom, the church, to His Father. It's over. You can't build something with a no where nothing's at. Can you build a building right here? Well, I could right there. I'm talking about right here. Once I move my hand, it's gone. There's nothing there. And once the heavens and the earth pass away in a great noise, you will not build nothing on earth because there will be no earth. 
And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? He's warning us, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved and being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Woo! You know what? I read that. And it's scary. I would like to come up with my own ingenuity and say that in a more meaningful way. I can't. How do you beat that? God says what He means and means what He says. Nevertheless, we according to His promise look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Oh, we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. You will have a new life in eternity. You will be there in the heaven with God Almighty. And anything that you require here on earth to exist, to be happy, it will all be there with us. We don't have to worry. I've been asked a million times, can you go fishing when you get to heaven? <laughs> I don't know. Can, can you go hunting? What would be a more important question to ask than those two things is this. Will they have charter so I can watch TV and a good controller that works and it never goes out? I don't know. But I know one thing. We'll all be happy. We will be so happy. Our safety it's not in a park. That thing is in Kentucky. We have a man here that took a whole bunch of us up there in a big old bus to see that big thing. Fan and I went to. We didn't go with them, but we went on by ourselves. And I got so tired of walking. Well, wasn't that ark big? But it was supposed to be safe. I didn't feel like it was safe. And I thought, what if this thing were to start rolling over? And I'm over on this side. I'd fall all the way down there. I'd kill myself. This thing's dangerous. But the ark is supposed to be safe, and it was safe to those people back then. I need a place of safety today. The body of Jesus Christ is our safety. That is our ark. I need to get in into the how the world, preacher. You get into a, a body. Our spiritual blessings are found in Jesus Christ. We are made new in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I want to become a new creature. I want to be sinless. I want to be, I want to be clean. I want to be free from sin. I want to be going to heaven. Where is that place at? It's in a place of safety. It's in the body of Christ. How do we get into our ark, which is the body of Christ? I told you, and I'll say it again. You don't need to care what I think, what I feel, or what I, what I believe. I need to be able to show you scriptures. And guess what? If I'm showing you God's Word and the Holy Spirit wrote it as you move through man, you need to be listening, don't you? Amen. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 is where we become children of God. We are baptized into the body of Christ. That is our ark of safety. You're baptized into the body of Christ. Got a question for you, preacher. Yeah. What is the body of Christ? Well, if you look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, we have been called out of darkness. That means sin. We've been called out of darkness into the Son of God Almighty. Into His kingdom. Well, that would be called like the kingdom of Jesus. Well, yeah, it sure would. If you go down five verses, because I haven't answered your question yet, have I? You asked me what the body was. I just told you. No, you didn't. You told me that it was the kingdom. I'm asking you about the body. Five verses later, he makes it real clear. It says, he, that Jesus, is the head of his body. <coughs> Comma, church. Kingdom of Christ, body of Christ, church of Christ. You have to get into 
the ark, our safety into the body of Christ. Do you understand a little bit more now? Never seen that, never thought about it. Okay? Let us make a comparison of one that might fall out of the boat. Now, I jumped out of a lot of boats, especially when I was young and <clears throat> what the body was intelligent. Was that? No. I've jumped out of boats, but I've heard of people that fish a lot. They fall out of the boat. I'm not going to embarrass anybody here by asking them, but I wonder if they fall out of the boat a lot. But <clears throat> we're talking about falling out of Christ. Josh says he fell out of the boat. I would have said that. <laughs> Let us make a comparison to one that might fall out of the boat. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Beware ye that think you stand, Christian. Why? Lest you fall. Are you saying that I can fall out of the body of Christ? Well, yeah. You'll always be a Christian, but you'll be a fallen away Christian. You go to Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, it says, It would be better that if you had not ever even known the wonderful blessings of being in Christ, and then to turn away and fall away. It's, it says it's impossible to repent and come back. That doesn't mean you could never repent, but what it means is you can get so cold, so lost, so distant, so far away, that you just could not be brought back. Oh, what a sad situation that would be. That would be like you fell out of the boat and we're going down a rapid river and I'm in the boat of safety and I see you out there and say, sorry, see you at the other end. We don't need to fall out of the boat. Galatians 5, 4 says this. You're saying that I can fall from grace. I don't believe you can you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. We need to get back in the boat. We've got to get in the boat. <coughs> those that have not repented, those that have not changed one weakness in their life to become strong, that stands in the way of being in safety in the body of Christ. We can only pray. And we need to pray with all of our hearts that these people will get in the boat. If you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ and no one's ever showed you, I'm fixing to the house. You need to get in the boat. You need to get in the body of Christ and be saved, free from sin. Be actually a real child of God. He knows who His children are. If you are a Christian and you've fallen off the boat, you've fallen away, fallen from grace. You need to repent now before it's eternally too late. You know, I never beg anyone to obey or repent. But if I thought it'd do good, I'd get on my hands and knees and beg anyone here that needs to change anything in their life. Because I don't want to go to heaven and you not be there. And I don't want you to not go to heaven and be with your loved ones. And if you don't, then your loved ones may not be there either. This is all real stuff. This is as serious as it gets. 1 John 1 9. If I confess my sins to God, and I've got a broken, contrite heart, and I mean it. I want to repent, God. You know what? God will do it every single time. He'll reach His big, strong hand right over, and He'll pull me right up back into the boat again. And say, John, I love you. I love you, son. You're forgiven of all your sins again. What a glorious blessing Christians have that have obeyed the gospel. We can repent. Here it is. A plan of salvation. Obviously, the first thing I need to do to become a Christian is I need to hear the gospel. Just like they did in Acts chapter 2. And they were cut to the heart. In other words, it brought them to their knees when they learned that Jesus Christ 
The man that they crucified on Calvary was actually the Son of God Almighty, their Savior. Oh, he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have just ended it all right there if he wanted to. He was God the Son. All the power in the world. But he didn't. Why? Because he loves me and you. That's why. He died hoping that we would obey his word. Become Christians. You have to hear the gospel. My faith cometh by hearing and hearing what? Only one thing. The word of God. Romans 10, 17. I have to believe it with every bone morsel of body I have. I believe from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. I thought we didn't live under the Old Testament. We don't. But the Old Testament teaches me what sin is. It's my tutor. It prophesied, told of the future when Jesus Christ was going to die for me. Yes, I believe in the entire book. You know what? I'm willing, I'm man enough, I'm woman enough, I'm strong enough, I'm bold enough, i got enough love in me and for those around me that I will, I will change anything in my life. I will repent. Once I know that I will do that, then, I have to be willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God Almighty. Mm -hmm. And then you know what? I'm fixing to get in the boat. Watch me get in the boat. Here's the way I do it. My boat into the body of Christ. I'm baptized into the body of Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. And here's why. Acts 2, 38. John, change, repent, and then be baptized. Why would I be baptized, God? I've already got all my sins forgiven. Read the verse, son. You're baptized for the removal, the remission of your sins. Your sins are not gone until you're baptized, son. You can't change the wording of the Bible. Repent and be baptized to every one of you. Why? For the remission of your sins. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That means God will know you are His Son, co-heirs with His own child, Jesus Christ. We will spend eternity in heaven together. Wow. The only other people that might miss the boat are Christians that have fallen out. So, we need to show our sincere faith every time we can. By coming forward to make our spiritual strength known to everyone around us. Or you can simply miss the boat. And you don't know if this will be the last boat that comes by your way or not. It's your decision. If you have a need, come forward as we span and sing.